It is now my distinct honor to introduce today's keynote. Born in Mexico to Syrian parents of Syrian descent, Judge Barquet has an impressive 30-year career that began in 1979 when Florida Governor Bob Graham appointed her a state trial court judge. He later elevated her to the state's intermediate appellate court, and he ultimately appointed her the first woman to serve on the Florida Supreme Court, where she was the first woman to be named its chief justice. In 1994, Anna Quinlan wrote in a New York Times op-ed, before Rosemary Barquette was Chief Justice of the Florida Supreme Court, she was a trial judge. And before that, she was a trial lawyer. And before being a trial lawyer, she was a nun. Which is why, during her confirmation hearings to the United States Courts of Appeals for the 11th Circuit, then-Senator Joe Biden harked back on his days in parochial school and asked whether she still had a clicker. <laughs> Any, anyone know this from school? Um, Justice Barquette replied, no, Senator, just a ruler to rap on the appropriate knuckles. I hope it won't be necessary this morning. <laughs> or today. Um, but little did she know. Nominated by President William Jefferson Clinton, her confirmation hearings took over six months. Senator Orrin Hatch, Strom Thurmond, and other members of the Judiciary Committee believed conservative jurists had been besieged by liberal senators, and they now intended to return the favor. But her qualifications stood the test, and she was confirmed, and Judge Barquette served with distinction for two decades. There, she authored landmark opinions in constitutional law, sexual harassment, disability rights, labor rights, privacy rights, rights of speech and association, and immigration. And in 2013, the Honorable Judge Barquette was, has since then served in her current role as judge on the Iran United States Claims Tribunal in The Hague, Netherlands. Always humble, she has won dozens of awards for her work, not only as a judge, but also as an individual. Two awards are given out each year in her honor and the Judge Rosemary Barquette Litigation Fund was established in her name at Americans for Immigrant Justice by committee members attending and represented here today. That's a shout out to Circe Denny, Mr. Scarola. The 2017 Prominent Woman in International Law Award, the Margaret Brent Women Lawyers of Achievement Award, the Latin Business and Professional Women Lifetime Achievement Award, and in 2018, Judge Barquette was awarded Leadership Florida's Lifetime Achievement Award. A shout out to the Leadership Florida table. And of course, back in 1986, Judge Barquette was inducted into the Florida Women's Hall of Fame. A pioneer, a trailblazer, a powerful voice for women around the world, ladies and gentlemen, the Honorable Rosemary Barquette. Thank you. Uh, I, I feel very much like it's old home week here. I uh, am very tempted. I saw so many old friends, uh, so many young old friends. Uh, I, I'm very tempted to say, uh, you've heard me a million and one times and you should all be excused, but I'm afraid that would empty the auditorium, so I won't say that, and you're going to have to stay and hear about a new chapter um, in my life. I'm also sorry that <clears throat> I, won't, I won't be as, uh, well, I may be, but I didn't intend to be as controversial as you apparently always seem to have at this podium. <laughs> I was told that you would be interested in learning about the job that I currently hold, so this is more of a of a this is what I'm doing now kind of speech rather than a let me tell you about my views on a lot of things. Although I will reiterate that I was born in Mexico and my parents were Syrian, my relatives, and I had a wonderful time growing up in a tricultural 
family, and I will make the point again that Mexicans and Syrians can become very good Americans, I hope. Um, the, the, what I, I, was, I was having a hard time trying to decide how to talk about what, I, what, I'm, what I'm doing now in the context of what I had done in, in the past. And it made me think of the old Joni Mitchell song, uh, which some of you in the back in the two tables probably have never heard, but <laughs> some of you at some of these other tables I know know uh, Joni Mitchell and her song, Both Sides Now. And the, one of the verses or one of the choruses goes something like, um, and Jack, I'm not going to sing and don't ask me to this time. Uh, I've looked at clouds from both sides now, from up and down and still somehow, it's clouds illusions, I recall. I really don't know clouds at all. I've had the extraordinary, I've had really extraordinary privilege of serving on trial courts, um, inter intermediate appellate courts, the Florida Supreme Court, and the federal courts, and now on an international arbitration tribunal and have also at the same time been able to serve as a private arbitrator in very large commercial arbitrations. And lo looking at all of those experiences, I feel a little bit like, like Joni Mitchell in the sense of having looked at so many ways of trying to achieve justice or a just society and f feeling a combination of being buoyed up by the efforts of trying to find ways to achieve justice and at the same time recognizing the shortcomings of each one of those institutions, but institutions which nonetheless we continue to try to develop and have in, in order to solve the problems of a multi-cultural, um, a multinational uh, human family. The, the, the court that I serve on now is, is very different in some ways and very similar in, in other ways to the various courts that I've served on before. Uh, let me get a little bit of geography out of the way first, if I might. The court, uh, the Iran-United States Claims Tribunal is, is a hybrid, really. It's not exactly a court because it's, uh, and it's not exactly an arbitration tribunal. Usually in an arbitration, arbitrators are appointed for one, uh, a, occasion for one event, they decide that event and they are disbanded thereafter. But this is an ongoing court that has been established since 1981, which is some, I never was very good at math, but I think it's something close to 40 years this court has been ongoing trying to solve uh, many of the disputes that occurred prior to 1979. So the first thing I'm going to say is that Nothing new comes before this tribunal. All claims had to have been established. All causes of action had to have been established prior to 1981. So we are trying to decide cases now where the evidence existed prior to 1981. And as you can imagine, that presents some very complicated and interesting questions. The tribunal sits in The Hague which, forgive me for those of you that already know this, but I, I have a huge family and they're always assuming that the Hague, a lot of them assuming that the Hague is a court. The Hague is a city in the Netherlands. It has approximately 500,000 um, residents. It's about 30 minutes or so uh, by train out of Amsterdam. And it is the uh, home of some four or five, six different international courts and many, many international uh, uh, institutions uh, like Eurojust and other kinds of organizations that are international in scope. Let me briefly just kind of tell you about some of the courts. The, um, the first court that 
sat in The Hague was the Permanent Court of Arbitration, which wasn't really a court. It was a tribunal that was established by uh, Tsar Nicholas II of Russia, and he was looking for a way for countries to settle their differences peacefully. So he started the Permanent Court of Arbitration, which then became the um, Permanent Court of International Justice, and that turned into the World Court, or the International Court of Justice, which is the entity of the United Nations, um, which resolves disputes between countries, so that if there's a border dispute between Bahrain and Qatar, for example, uh, one of the countries will sue in the World Court, and the, the court of 15 members from different countries, 15 different countries all over the world will resolve that particular matter. At the present time, Iran is suing the United States in the World Court for two discrete separate actions which have nothing to do with the, with the tribunal upon which I serve. So I am not on the World Court, um, but it is, I am on one of the courts that sits in The Hague. There's also the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, which is another UN entity. And let me digress for a second to say there are two ways these international, well, there may be more, but two main ways that international courts get established. One is they are formed by the United Nations, like the World Court, which is the judicial arm of the United Nations, or they are established by the United Nations, as was the International Criminal Court for the former Yugoslavia, where many of the uh, people during the Bosnia um, wars were, were tried. And also now, presently, there's a, a Lebanon, a court for Lebanon, uh, being where the defendants are being tried for the assassination of, um, of Prime Minister Hariri. And the difficulties that are encountered by these courts are huge because once they're first established, they have to determine what rules they're going to use, what evidence, standards of evidence they're going to employ. And with all of the judges coming from different countries and different legal systems and different ways of, uh, of evaluating evidence and establishing a procedure for bringing claims, you can imagine the difficulties that, that exist. The other way is by treaty, which is how our court was established. The International Criminal Court, uh, for example, was established by the Rome Treaty, which was signed by something like 150, 180, maybe 200 uh, countries. We are not a signatory. We did not sign on to the International Court, Criminal Court, although many of our diplomats and state uh, department officials had a lot to do with drafting the treaty which established the, in, the International Criminal Court. So our court was established by, as Barbara mentioned, the, um, you should be excused from this lecture too since you already knew so much about it, but um, we were established uh, as a result of a treaty that was negotiated by the country of Algiers because as you can imagine we were not on very easy speaking uh, terms with, with the Iranians at that time. But let me give you a little bit of the history <clears throat> of how every, everything sort of came about. Um, in 1951, a prime minister, Mohammed Mossadegh, was elected by the people in a popular election to be the prime minister of, of Iran. He worked as a prime minister for approximately three years, and he was a big reformer. And one of the things that he wanted to reform was the fact that uh, all of the exclusive rights to Iranian oil were being held by the British. And so he felt, as did some of the people in his government, that Iranians ought to have sort of a piece of the pie. And so he also established a lot of other kinds of reforms. The UK was not very happy with the fact that he wanted to um, nationalize the oil or bring Iranians into the, into the fold, as it were. 
And so the UK persuaded the United States to work with them and to overthrow the regime of, of Mohammed Mossadegh. Now, the Shah of Iran was still the Shah at the time, but he did not want to overturn uh, this prime minister because the prime minister was very popular. But, and there are lots of books written on the subject, the UK and the US worked really hard to sow dissent and to generate a rebellion and ultimately persuaded the Shah be, by sowing this rebelliousness throughout uh, Iran to fire Mossadegh, to arrest him, to have some of the people in his, um, in his administration um, executed uh, and put him under house arrest for the rest of his, of his life. So the Shah then put somebody new in power that would cooperate with the Brits and with the United States. And what then happened from 1953 to 1979, and, and I have to say in, in this whole history, I, I have to, as an aside, reiterate, no matter how vehemently we disagree with one another, we have a country where the ballot box prevails and we don't execute the people that we disagree with and that's something that we should all be very, very thankful for. So, <clears throat> so from 1953 to about 1979, stuff was happening in Iran. American businesses and American oil companies, American insurance companies, all kinds of American business people began to m go to Iran, to move to Iran, to uh, uh, establish businesses in, in Iran, and the Shah's government was extraordinarily favorable to American businesses and American entities that were doing business there. So we had this wonderful relationship with Iran during the time between 1953 to 1970-something, 75, 78 maybe, but at the same time, the Iranian people weren't so happy. They were getting very upset. First of all, there were still the remnants of uh, Prime Minister Mossadegh's uh, party. There were people who were getting very angry with the Shah and with the excesses of uh, spending, a uh, waste of money, the fact that, that um, so much was being taken out of the country by foreign entities, both British, American, and others. And so things were being fomented in a very uh, un, un, unhappy uh, kind of way, which culminated ultimately in the revolution um, uh, of, of Iran. The Shah finally in 1979 fled to the United States, ultimately, well, he fled Iran first and then he wanted to be taken in by the US because he was ill and President Carter would not refuse him entry into the United States while at the same time, the revolutionary people in Iran were demanding his return. He was given uh, asylum in the United States for medical treatment and it was after that that the revolutionaries stormed the embassy. They took 52 of our, host of, of our diplomats and, and staff, and they kept them for over a year in captivity, as has been uh, described to you. We made lots of efforts to get them back. We tried a very ill-fated, uh, it, it is not a movie that Christian Bale will star in, we sent four or five or six helicopters to Iran to try to effectuate a, a, a rescue, but they sent the wrong helicopters and they couldn't deal with the sand and so they broke down and that ended that attempt. So then by this time we were of course desperate to get our people home and we worked then through Algeria to try to resolve the crisis and bring the hostages home. But there were some other economic reasons for wanting to solve this crisis. In addition to taking the, the hostages, it, the Iranians also confiscated all of the property that all of these businesses had been, uh, had been involved in, in establishing in Iran. So the American businesses wanted to be recompensed for the property they lost. We wanted to have the hostages returned. And at the same time, 
uh, Carter's response had been to freeze all assets, which were um, all assets which had been uh, frozen uh, by the president uh, until some resolution could be had. And so there were millions and millions and millions of dollars that ultimately um, were frozen in which the Iranians wanted to unfreeze and many Iranian businesses and the country of Iran wanted to have returned. So there was incentive on both sides to enter into this agreement. Ultimately, a treaty was signed which provided for the return of the hostages, which provided for the uh, recompense to Americans for any property that had been taken, which unfroze Iranian assets and which gave back to, uh, and which promised for the United States to assist in giving back to Iran any Iranian property that was held uh, in, in the United States. Of course, that meant that somebody had to decide what belonged to whom and or how much damage had been done to property that had been taken. So the, uh, the tribunal was established. It was to be a nine member tribunal. There would be three members appointed by the United States. There would be three members appointed by Iran. And those uh, six members would then appoint uh, three uh, members from third countries, other countries, and if they couldn't agree, provision was made for an appointing authority to appoint the third country members. So at the present time, there are three Americans, uh, of, of which I am one. There are three Iranians uh, who have been appointed, and we have two Germans and one Swiss who serves as the president of the tribunal and the nine uh, members who have changed over the years. As you can imagine, this thing has been going on for almost 40 years, and so there hasn't been one person who has continually served all that time. The composition has changed, and in the early days, there was a great deal of, of um, acrimony. Uh, there was uh, an event at one point where two of the Iranians attacked physically one of the third country members from Sweden and uh, in this stairwell and had to be uh, separated. But that does not occur any, anymore, I assure you. Uh, and uh, so throughout the years, however, there have been, so one of the things that I know would immediately come to mind is, so what, what the hell have you guys been doing for 40 years? Um, <laughs> Well, during the last 30-some years, the tribunal has resolved over 4,000 claims in total. They have awarded something like $2.5 billion to American claimants, either business people or individuals who have made claims against Iran. And they have awarded Iranian uh, citizens or companies the equivalent of maybe $1.5 billion. The Americans have all been paid off by a fund which part of the treaty required that a fund be established in order to pay out claims to the American claimants. We did not have to put up any money to pay the Iranian claimants, but they, they have all, all been paid. So what is there left to do? What is left before the tribunal is the, um, are the claims between the two countries. All the individual claims have been uh, resolved, but the claims that the country of Iran has against the United, the country of the United States are still in existence and they are being resolved today. There are two main large cases. One involves some 69 claims of property, personal property that is being held by individual Americans, uh, different kinds of claims uh, involving personal property, some artwork which was supposed to be sold uh, and they, the Tehran Museum did not receive, uh, which the, they are claiming the artist should have sent, a violin which was taken out of Iran, which the, belonged to the Shah, which they claim should have been returned. And there is a provision in the treaty which says that the United States will arrange will arrange for the transfer of all Iranian property to Iran. 
And that one phrase for all the lawyers in the room and the non-lawyers too, because you'll understand has caused great uh, deal of debate and very fascinating and interesting legal questions because you have to decide what is Iranian property. Some of this property the Iranians paid some money toward, so they believe they have an interest in it. The United States takes the position that Iranian property means you have to have title to the property, and so therefore title gets decided by the place where the property exists. And there are many other legal questions which become a fascinating and interesting new challenge uh, for, for me. The, so that is ongoing, those 69 individual claims. Then there is what they call the very big claim. During the time, as I mentioned, that we were having this sort of honeymoon between the United States and Iran, the United States, uh, Iran became the the biggest client of the United States under its Foreign Military Sales Act. The Foreign Military Sales Act provides that the United States can sell to another country all kinds of military equipment. Because the United States felt that Iran was our sort of representative in the, in the Middle East, they were very willing and sold, uh, I don't know, entered into some 2,000 plus contracts, separate contracts for the sale of military equipment. The military equipment being things like submarines, uh, missile systems, uh, F-16 airplane, uh, uh, air airplanes, um, and from, from, from the biggest destroyers of ship, in ships to the smallest screws, all of this it w were uh, noted or involved or, or were the subject of these 2,000 and some contracts. So the claim that is being heard today, right now, is the claim that Iran has against the United States asserting that the United States, uh, oh, let me back up one, one step. The, the United States, by law, is not permitted to extend credit for any, to any country for the sale of military equipment. So what they require is that the uh, foreign country has to set up a trust in the, in the, within the United States Treasury and fund it. So the, the way it works is when they order a part or a destroyer or a plane and it gets delivered from the United States or from a third party provider, the United States then deducts that amount from the trust and then they have to re, re add, add to it once again. So uh, the, the Iranians are claiming now that many things that were promised were not delivered or were, um, not delivered in full, and there's a huge debate over the question of termination costs because we stopped dead in the middle of these 2,000 contracts in 1981, of course, when the hostages were taken. We obviously were not going to continue to sell, and maybe a little bit before that, continue to sell military equipment to Iran under those circumstances. So the question then arises under the contract and under the subsequent memorandum of understanding which was drawn up at the last few days of the, of the, um, uh, of, of the revolution, who pays the termination costs? Um, some of the things that were not finished, that had to, payments had to be made to contractors, who pays for the termination costs under the contract. So it's all of those issues which are presently being uh, resolved, trying to be resolved. Some of these cases have not yet even been briefed. Um, there are 25 test cases which are presently being, we, we're, we're attempting to resolve 25 test cases now. Um, hoping that that will establish some law and the parties can then negotiate and work through some of the remaining contracts, but there is no telling uh, how, how that's going to proceed as we are in the process of doing that now. The, um, the, 
the two parties, the State Department, the, the lawyers for the United States come from the State Department. The lawyers for Iran come from uh, the UK. They're, they're British lawyers. They have a fascinating way of presenting the argument for those of you that are here uh, that are <laughs> that work in the law. Please appreciate the process that you have, and for the judges especially, because the process is very European in that the lawyers have prepared remarks, um, which they then read to you for three hours at a stretch. <laughs> And then the lawyer for the other side gets up with their prepared remarks and reads to you for three hours more. And then you get to go home and come back the next day for another eight hours of being read to. Not only that, but we have these computers, we have these live note things so that the court reporter is taking it so you not only are hearing it, you are seeing it in writing. <laughs> and uh, it's a, uh, you don't ask questions, by the way. Uh, because it is a very sensitive thing to ask a question which requires a country's um, concession, perhaps, and they cannot do that without going back to their country representatives and say, can I, can I agree to this or can I answer it this way? And so at the end of each side's initial presentation, then the judges get to ask questions. Well, of course, you've now forgotten the first <laughs> the first presentation that presented some questions. And now the complexity of what is being presented is pretty overwhelming because they have to explain the whole logistic system of how these contracts were um, developed and how they were billed and what was used in order to ascertain whether something had or had not been delivered. And each of the services, the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, each had a separate system of how, how to account for all of these sales. So it's been a, a fascinating experience to try to grapple with these things, which we are still continuing to grapple with. Um, we work in English. Uh, we are both a trial and an appellate court so that we, um, I, am I going way over this time for questions? I'm gonna quit in a minute. I'm almost done with the main part of this. Um, we um, have uh, testimony from witnesses, but of course the witnesses are people who were doing things like 40 years ago. Uh, documents are hard to read. The, the, the evidence consists of accounting records, which are uh, very, very large. Uh, I think 400 boxes were delivered to the tribunal when they were first uh, submitting <laughs> evidence. And um, we have one law clerk. Each of the judges has one law clerk. Uh, we have two secretaries uh, between us, so I very much miss the four law clerks that the federal government gives you and the secretary to boot and uh, have to, uh, as my friends who are neither lawyers nor judges say, ha, huh, now you know how the rest of the world <laughs> lives. You have to do things for yourself. It has been fabulous. We speak in English, uh, we debate in English, but you have to understand that English is not the native tongue of any of the judges besides the Americans, and therefore you have to be very, very careful to be very clear, because although they are fluent, um, still there are expressions, idioms that are, that are difficult, and communication, uh, you want to try to be as precise as possible. I cannot tell you how privileged I feel to have done and had the opportunity to do all, all of the things on behalf of, of, of this country. And that is certainly one of the one of the one of the greatest opportunities that I've had, and I can't wait to see what is going to be offered, like when I get to be 95. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Let's see. Oh. Judge Barquette, thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. Today's questions come directly from our audience. It's an opportunity for us as citizen leaders to hear news and information directly from the source in an unfiltered way. 
If any of you have cards and questions for Judge Barquette, uh, please hold them in the air and we'll bring them forward. To kick off, we begin with two questions from our students. Afterwards, it's questions that have been submitted from the audience. If the first student, Bobby from Palm Beach Lakes High School, would please stand, introduce herself, and ask the question. Thank you. Hello. Good afternoon. My name is Joshua Sands from the Law Academy at Palm Beach Lakes High School. And my question is, should voters determine the merit retention for Florida Supreme Court justices, or should these be lifetime um, appointments? Well, no, voters shouldn't determine that at all because judges can't very well uh, take a position on anything while they're, quote, running for office. I mean, I, I think the only thing you can say if you're, if you're running for office as a judge, or at least the judge I would want to vote for, somebody who said to me, I, I just want to promise you that if you're wrong, I'm going to vote against you. Uh, you can't, it's, it's impossible for judges to, um, to take positions against another person and the merit retention system is equally difficult because voters have, first of all, people don't understand the voter retention system. I'm gonna try to be short, that's so hard for me. Um, <laughs> Voters, uh, when I was running, uh, I had to run a merit retention campaign, as many of you know, and somebody came up to me and said, well, I asked my friend if uh, he was going to vote to retain Judge so-and-so on the appellate court, and he said, hell no, he's a good judge. <laughs> so it, it appears as though some people think that like being retained means being kept back in school or something. I, I, I don't know what they think, but it is not clear. And you cannot have people voting in an election. It's hard enough to understand the candidates when they're supposed to be running against one another and what they stand for, but judges, I, it's, it's really impossible. So what do you want in a judge? You want someone who has integrity, you want someone who is competent, you want someone who is going to um, uh, be, a, be somewhat of a, of, of a scholar and is going to be fair and neutral. And how do you, how, and, and they assume in a merit retention race that there's this perfect person that's going to take your place and vote the way you want them to vote in every single case, and that's just not gonna happen. It's, I don't think it's a good system, but, and I think that the federal system is a much better system for many reasons, but uh, maybe it could use some tweaking too. There should be some accountability. So I believe that there should be um, lifetime tenure on, on a court, especially an appellate court, uh, but perhaps there should be some tweaking in terms of the years of service or some other way to assure accountability because we want judges uh, to remain on the bench as long as they are being fair and competent and doing their job. Thank you. If the next student will please rise out and now ask a question. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Elijah Cardi. I'm from Palm Beach Place Community High School and I'm a part of the Law Academy. And my question for you is, what role should the International Court of Justice and other international courts have in interrupt interpreting treaties enter into by the United States or other countries? I'm um, not sure I understand. What role should international courts have in interpreting treaties? Is yes, that ma the question? Uh, usually, if it's a court, if it's a court that's been created by a treaty, the treaty itself gives the court the power to interpret the, the language of the treaty. Ours does that, and so it's the treaty itself that gives the court the power to do so. When it's a question of a dispute, it's uh, between, for example, borders. Courts will look at the evidence and make a, and make a decision based on that. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. All right, from our audience, Judge Barquette. You have been an outspoken proponent of women's rights and victims' rights throughout your career. <laughs> do you believe... <laughs> Uh, well deserved, well deserved. Do you believe the recent passage of Amendment 6 here in Florida will positively impact your efforts? Uh-oh. Uh, uh, Amendment uh, 6. Victims' rights. Victims' and... rights, yes. I, um, 
or you wasn't can... that connected with something else? <laughs> I thought there was a, I have not kept up with the, but something must have happened. I thought there was a one subject rule in this state. Did there used to be that? <laughs> I don't know what happened. <laughs> That, that's fair. So if you wish to just speak about victims' rights and victim, skip the We've amendment. always taken into account victims' rights, as far as, as I know. Victims could speak to judges during sentencing. Um, and so I, I'm not really clear as to what that amendment does any more than we had before this amendment was, was passed. Okay. Judge And, and I, I do have to say, there are so many people that I'm unfortunately so comfortable with that I don't mean to be flip, but it's very hard not to be when I look out and I see people that I know and I feel like I'm at a lunch with them and it's okay to be flip. So I apologize if it's too flip for some people here. Um, I don't know. Well, don't well no problem be. because Pastor Patty will be able to absolve us all. <laughs> Next question, Justice Roberts rebuked President Trump's characterization of a federal judge as an Obama judge. What are the long-term impacts of this conflict and maybe this type of public characterization? But, I'm sorry, what as an, could you just read so that? So it says <laughs> Justice Roberts rebuked I got that President Trump's characterization. Yeah. What are the long-term impacts of of this type of public characterization? Well, you can't, you, you can't impugn the integrity of a judge simply because a particular person appointed him. I mean, all you have to do is look at your history. I mean, people like Eisenhower and Harry Truman used to complain that the, the stupidest thing I ever did was put that guy on the court or something along those, uh, along those lines. Why? Because when you're a private citizen, you have views and you, and, and, and you espouse them and you advocate for them. But when you put on the robes of a judge, you swear that you're going to be neutral and you're going to hear the evidence on both sides. And please God, we still have a judiciary who will do that instead of advancing a particular view, which is not to say that you cannot criticize judges but you have to criticize them for something specific. You cannot, this whole business about activist judges used to make me so mad. Somebody would come up to me and say, oh, Judge Barquette, I admire you so much. You know, I don't agree with all your opinions, but and I, I, I used to be a good girl like my mother and my, everybody taught me to be, and I'd say thank you very much, very meekly, and then I got older, and once you get older, <laughs> you can say things like, Really? And which opinion specifically do you not agree with? <laughs> and they would look at you and they couldn't tell you because they didn't know and all they're doing is parroting stuff that some person <laughs> has told them to. You can't do that. You criticize a judge's opinion because you say they got the facts wrong or their logic doesn't work or something pertaining to, their, to, to what is written that is logical and that makes sense. You can't just say, well, he was appointed by so-and-so. Anyway, that's what I think. <laughs> Thank you very much. Judge Barquette, what are the two most important lessons you learned in your European journeys that you would want to transmit to Americans? You should travel in Europe. Every single person should go. There are so many different ways of doing things and you cannot isolate yourself and think that we know, I mean, how to do everything. Um, and it's beautiful. And um, I would want them to know that, they're, that the lifestyle is a very um, healthy one. I live in the middle of the downtown area, the old town of The Hague. You have to walk many places. You ride your bike to work. M most everybody rides their bike to work because owning a car is expensive, gas is expensive, and um, it, it clogs everything up, and so people use it as their main course of, of, uh, of transportation. You see people in tuxedos and in high heels 
biking to work. Um, and so I, I, and there's so many beautiful things from which we derive so much here in, here in this country. I travel, and it's a lot of fun. Come visit, oh no, I shouldn't say, my, <laughs> my staff put a, a card on my, on my computer uh, with three quotes. Um, I'm sorry I won't be in The Hague during this time. <laughs> and two is something else and something else because I just invite everybody to come. You should come. And if you come, come visit me in The Hague. <laughs> Judge Barquette, your appointment to the state Supreme Court presented some unusual problems. The justices' chambers had only two restrooms, one marked justices and the other marked women. Your appointment brought an end to that. Six men, first woman. No. <laughs> what other impacts did your appointment bring to the chambers? <laughs> I think there wasn't a woman's bathroom in the, in the chambers part, it was just said justices. So they had to build a, a cut, do a cutout for the separate bathroom. And I, I will confess that uh, I would threatened to chase them into the men's room if they did, didn't uh, finish the argument or whatever it is we were, we were doing. They were funny. Um, what other changes? I, I, I don't know. Ray Ehrlich told the same jokes that he always used to tell, whether I was in the room or not. Maybe he toned them down a little bit. So did they call the justices like uh, oh, Mr. Justice? Oh, you mean Justices? Madam Justice? Oh. Is that what you meant? No, they, they cut that out. I mean, they, I think they were cutting that out beforehand. I think Sandra Day O'Connor um, eliminated that practice on the Florida, I mean, on the United States Supreme Court because Madam Justice sounded like, you know what it sounded like. <laughs> so if my information is correct. Although as the older I get, the more I think maybe it would be fun to... <laughs> If, if our information is Sorry. correct, you were one of nine children growing up in Miami, so, so it must have been some kind of luxury having your own restroom in the chambers. <laughs> yes. yes, that's true. <laughs> um, Justice Barquette, you began your career in 1979, the same year of the Iran hostage crisis. Could you have ever imagined that in its 40th anniversary, you would be representing the United States on the tribunal? No, I couldn't imagine, I, I could not imagine uh, that I would have had the opportunity to do any of the things I did. I, I consider them unbelievably, uh, I don't want to say lucky accidents because maybe you'll take my job away or something, but I, um, I, I was able to, well, you know, it, it is luck in so many ways. You cannot take credit for what you are, what you have, because so much of it is, there's a, if you get a chance, Google um, Justice John Roberts' commencement address to his son's junior high school graduation. It is an unbelievably wonderful piece. And he talks about, uh, wanting to recognize, wanting, wanting something unfair to happen to these kids because that will make them realize the importance of fairness and to also realize that being, you're born to the parents that you're born in the country in which you were born or in my case, the ability to come to this country. Uh, you're born with the intelligence that God has given you, not that you earned by any Way I mean yes you have to make the best of it uh, of your of your gifts um, but the gifts didn't come from you and so um, I couldn't know I couldn't imagine it I was even as practicing law in West Palm Beach with many of the people that I see here um, my court reporter was here Janet somewhere she's somewhere here. Uh, <laughs> I couldn't, I couldn't have imagined when I was practicing law that I would ever get to be a trial judge, never in a hundred years. And when I was a trial judge, I couldn't imagine being on the appellate bench. I mean, it just, the opportunities 
provided themselves. I like to believe that I was prepared for them and took advantage of them when they uh, uh, appeared. But um, no, I, I had no, I, I mean, I listened to these kids back there who say, I say, oh, you want to be a lawyer? And they said, no, we want to be a judge. Okay, <laughs> That's that, which is great. I applaud you for that. But I had no thought that I could be uh, or have many of the jobs that I've been lucky enough to have. Uh, just to let the crowd know, earlier, Judge Barquette actually just caught a glimpse of the lovely lady that's her former court reporter <laughs> and hadn't seen her in over 30 years, but recognized her right away. So um, we want to take the vitamins that you're taking. <laughs> for, for our last question, in a past interview, you shared that your time at the convent was like a sorority, but without the parties. <laughs> So what did you girls do to kick back and relax? I think other times I've likened it to the army with, without the uniforms. Um, what did I take from the convent? I, I said, you, you said it was like a sorority, but without the parties. What? So how did you kick back and relax? Did you watch Sister? <laughs> uh, we sang. Sister Act? We sang a lot of songs and... Uh, I, when I said sorority, what I meant was that there was this tremendous sense. I mean, you have these. When I entered the convent, I was 17 years old. And as were many of the other women who, well, they were girls, who, who entered the convent at the same time I did. And we were up the road in Jensen Beach, which is where the novitiate was. And um, you had a whole, like, 20 or 30 or 40 young women who were so desperate and wanted so much to do good. And so they would do good for one another. You know, you'd leave your shoes out and somebody would have them polished the next day. You were trying to outdo everybody and trying to be uh, good to one another. And I think it was that spirit of, 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 of unity and uh, I don't know what I meant when I said that, but it's, it, it's that kind of a thing that I was trying to convey. Well, but judge the parties, we had parties, but we just sang and we had Kool-Aid and we had, I don't know. <laughs> um, judge Barquette, we'd like to first thank you for your lifetime of selfless service. <laughs> thank, you. thank you very much. Thank you, for, thank you for traveling all the way from the, the Hague. Thank you. We look forward to seeing everyone on December 19th for Frank Luntz here at the Kravis Center. Thank you all very much. Hope you all had a happy Thanksgiving.